It's December the 20th, and therefore the 20th day of the advent of compiler optimizations. And finally, we're going to start looking at some vectorization. <laughs> Over here in Compiler Explorer, I get to walk down memory lane because I get to use the button at the top here, which lets me load an example. And we don't really have very many examples. It was always my intention to have lots and lots of examples of cool things, but I suppose this series is those lots of things. Um, but one of the examples is this max array. This max array takes an array of doubles and runs through them, picking the largest element, writing that into the first argument. So X is an array of 65,000 doubles, Y is an array of 65,000 doubles as well, and we're going to update X with the max of the two, element-wise. And over here, well, first of all, it, uh, it's always upset me, actually, that this is not a const over here. This should be a const. Um, so it doesn't change the code, but is something I should change in the code. If only I had the ability to change that, eh? Never mind. So we're going to loop over 65,000 times. There are much better ways of doing this, of course, but let's have a look at the code on the right-hand side. We uh, set our counter to zero. We read the zeroth element into XMM zero. We compare the zeroth element with the zeroth element in the other array. So here we're looking at racks as the offset, and we're looking at the base of RSI versus the base of RDI. And if you remember correctly, and I can just check on my mug, yes, RDI is the first parameter. So RDI is the X. So here we're reading Y and we're comparing it with the X element and the racks element. Um, if it is below, that is if the, gosh, I'm going to do this again. If the X element is below the Y element, then we're going to jump to L2 and just carry on. So otherwise we're going to write the y element into the x location makes sense that is what we've asked it to do no vectorization happening here vectorization i should explain is when we're picking up more than one element at a time and using special instructions simd instructions single instruction multiple data where that single instruction applies to multiple pieces of data at once usually a bunch of doubles or floats or ints that have been packed together into a big register, one of those XMM or sometimes you'll see YMM or even ZMM registers, which are 128 bit or 256 bit or 512 or and above bit, which is huge. But we're able to apply the same instruction to chunks of that register in parallel. That hasn't happened here. We're doing them one element at a time. And uh, the way that I can tell that is because I tend to look at the add instruction that's happening in the loop. And here we're adding racks with eight, which means that we're moving eight bytes forward at a time. Eight bytes is the size of a double. Therefore, we're only doing one at a time. So even though you've seen this XMM here, which might make you think, oh, is this doing some kind of clever um, parallel instruction? It is not. That will change if I change the optimization level up to 03. So let's do that. And there's a reason why I've not been doing this so far. Um, it generates a lot more code it should generate a lot more code. It has not generated a lot more code. Why did it not generate more code? What happened? Aha. So in order to get some vectorization, I'm gonna turn the optimizer up to level three and I'm gonna tell it the architecture we're targeting, which in this instance I will say is Skylake, which is a relatively modern CPU. And immediately we can see a lot of things have started happening. A lot more code has been generated. Oh, not that much more actually now I look at it, but it's a lot more. And that's one of the reasons why I've avoided so far talking about vectorization. And I've gone to great pains to sort of turn off or use ISAs that don't have um, vector instructions because then the code is easier to walk through. But I think you're ready for it. Let's do it. So the first thing that's happening, I'm going to gloss over for now. We're not going to look at what these things are doing. It's complicated, but we'll come back to it at the end. Let's just look at the happy case where we're at L4. L4 is the beginning of a loop, and we are reading into a YMM register. So we are using Skylake, and that has access to these Y-based registers, which are 256-bit wide. We're reading the whole of that register. We're reading the whole of 
um, so this is what well, RSI is Y. So this is Y into YMM1, and this is X into YMM0. And YMM putter is, as I say, 256 bits wide. We're doing a compare. Now, vector compares are kind of unusual. Vector compares compare each part of the 256 bits and treats them as four independent double precision numbers. So it's comparing the four double numbers in the YMM register with the four double numbers in YMM uh, zero. So we're doing four comparisons at once. And that means that we don't have one set of flags at the end. We have four flags that tell me whether or not they're greater than or less than or equal each element by element. We're then going to test to see if all of the values in X were less than the values in Y, in which case we don't need to update anything. And if so, we jump to L3 and skip the next instruction. Otherwise, at least one of the Y values was not less than the X value, and therefore we have to update it. So this mask mov lets it write back that wide register, but only where the flags are set appropriately. So it kind of writes back partial parts of the register. Again, only the parts that need to be updated get updated by this instruction. And then the clue that we're doing vectorization is the fact that we're now moving forward 32 bytes at a time. 32 bytes is 256 bits, which is to say we're moving four double precision floats at a time. That's fantastic. And so we're going for the same number of instructions, nearly the same number of instructions, we're going four times faster. And if we change this to be floats, we'll see that the same thing can happen, except that we're now doing eight at a time. So it'll still use YMM registers, and it will still use the compare, but it'll use this S version. The end here is a single precision versus double precision. And so we're still moving 32 bytes at a time. It's just we're doing eight floats now instead of four double precision numbers. So we're going really quite fast here. We can go even faster if we replace this if statement. So the one thing that really puts the spanner in the works for uh, SIMD, single instruction multiple data, is having things that are different for each element. And here, this if check is effectively different for each element. Now, the compiler has done some gymnastics to try and make it as efficient as possible using the mask reads and writes and that kind of thing, but we can go one better. If we don't mind unconditionally writing to the X array, even if it was already the max of the two, then we can make this go even more efficiently. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to change this to be xi is equal to, so unconditionally, we're going to say, if, X, if y is greater than uh, xi, then y of i, else x of i. So I'm now using the ternary operator to update. And now our loop has gotten even more compact. So L3 here, um, we can see that the compiler has generated a read from the RSI, which again is the y. And then it's using a max instruction. It has realized that our greater than comparison that we're doing, there's actually an instruction that's capable of doing this. And so it unconditionally maxes uh, YMM with RDI, the X parameter. And again, this is eight floats worth at a time. And then it's moving back the, uh, the result. So these three instructions are capable of maxing eight elements of our array at a time. Then we're moving forward 32 and we're jumping around and we're looping back to L3 here. That's about as beautiful as a sequence of instructions you're going to see from a compiler. It's wonderful. There are still a couple of elephants in the room. I said that little bit at the top of the uh, function that we would talk about it later, and I'm afraid it's now time to talk about it. When you're working with SIMD instructions, they are picking up multiple elements at once. And so the compiler has to be able to prove that reading eight or 16 or however many elements of an array and acting on them and then writing them back is exactly the same as having gone through them one at a time. And that is only true if the arrays that the compiler are working on, if it's got two arrays, are non-overlapping. You could imagine if X and Y were actually pointing at the same area of memory, or worse, if X and Y were pointing at the same area but only overlapped by, say, one float, then acting eight at a time has a different answer than if you just go through them one at a time. And that is what our check at the beginning of this routine is doing. It's a pretty complicated check, and I think my blog post goes into more details as to how it's working. But effectively, it's saying, are these two pointers overlapping by 32 bytes or not? 
If they are, then we go to L2. And L2 is the single version of the loop. It is doing them one at a time. That is, it is doing a max and a mov still, but you can see that, first of all, the S for single precision is there, but also S for single is in this instruction. And we're only updating by moving the point of four units at a time, the size of a single float. So that is unfortunate. Up here in the parallel case, that P towards the end of the instruction means it's parallel, parallel single precision here. So there are two clues we can get that this is a not vectorized version. Uh, the fact that it's got an S and the fact that it's moving it by four at a time as opposed to the P and 32 at a time. Um, another sort of wart here is that having monkeyed with the top few bits of the X and Y registers, uh, sometimes it's more efficient to clear them out again before you return to other code for complicated micro-architectural reasons. So you'll see the compiler sometimes emits this V0 upper instruction. You can, for all intents and purposes, ignore it and just sort of see it as a bit of noise in the flow. But uh, it's another clue, though, that the compiler has used some vector operations. Uh, so you can use it for that, I guess, as diagnostic. So we've covered vectorization today, or at least a little bit of it. We've scratched the surface of the kind of thing the compiler can do for you. It is possible to write vector code yourself. There are some intrinsics and things that you can use, but from some little loops like this, the compiler can actually do a really good job by itself. And most of the STL algorithms that accumulate and that lot will do the right thing for you if you use them and you have the compiler turned up to the right level. Just remember to set the, uh, the optimization level accordingly and try and target a CPU that has useful instructions for you and then you'll get the benefit of it. Either way, we're gonna continue looking at some of the other cool things that the compiler can do tomorrow. I hope to see you then. We'll